Good morning, readers. Today is Friday, January 8th, and you're listening to First Chapter Fridays, presented by the Baker Free Library. My name is Juliana, and I am the library's youth services librarian. Welcome to this week's program. Every Friday, I'll be sharing the first chapter of a middle grade book with you. Middle grade books are designed for readers aged 8 to 12, but they can be enjoyed by readers of every age. We hope that this program will introduce you to authors and titles you've never read or considered before. If you like today's chapter, you can place a reserve on the featured book through the library's catalog or by calling the library at 224-7113. If you'd like something to do while you listen, head to the library's website, bowbakerfreelibrary.org. On the 4Kids page, listed under Events and Programs, you'll find a link to an active listening worksheet that you can download and print. While you're listening today, jot down any thoughts, questions, or ideas you have about the story. You can also draw, doodle, pick up your room, or work on a craft project while you listen. All right, let's jump into today's story. Our book today is called Ophelia and the Marvelous Boy, written by Karen Foxley. Karen Foxley lives and works in Australia and has written a number of books for children and teens. This book, Ophelia and the Marvelous Boy, was published in 2014. It is a modern-day fairy tale, loosely based on the story of the Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen, which was also the inspiration for Disney's Frozen. This book includes elements of mystery, fantasy, and adventure, and it's a perfect read for these cold, wintry days. Here's a little more about the story. Ophelia Jane Worthington Wittard doesn't believe in anything that can't be proven by science. She and her sister, Alice, are still grieving for their mother when their father takes a job in a strange museum in a city where it never stops snowing. On her very first day exploring the museum, Ophelia discovers a boy locked away in a forgotten room. He is a prisoner of Her Majesty, the Snow Queen, and he's been waiting a long time for Ophelia's help. As she embarks on an incredible adventure to rescue the boy, everything she believes is tested. Along the way, she learns more and more about the boy's own remarkable journey to reach her and save the world. Want to hear more? Let's dive into the first chapter of Ophelia and the Marvelous Boy by Karen Foxley. The north wind doth blow, and we shall have snow. In the end, the queen was nothing like she was in the stories the marvelous boy had been told, first as a child beside the hearth, and later by the wizards. There were no claws, no sharp teeth. She was young. Her pale hair dripped over her shoulders. She opened her blue eyes wide and smiled sweetly at the king. "'I do not like him, my darling,' she said, not once raising her voice. "'I do not like him one little bit.' "'But he's my marvelous boy,' stammered the king." He hated to disappoint her. They were only newly wed. That is the problem exactly, she said. They tell me he does not age, that he has been here ten years yet looks just as he did when he arrived, that his hair has not grown, nor his body. He makes me uneasy. I cannot sleep peacefully while he is free to roam. And this story, they tell me, of the sword he carries. How can I feel safe when I hear such a thing? Now, now, said the king, for many years he has been my faithful companion. I should like him locked away, she said. Locked away? We shall lock him away. He shall be locked in a room and allowed out only to be exhibited. He shall be displayed beside all my other precious things. He is a curiosity. I will feel safer. I don't know, said the king. He is a good boy. He means no harm. The new queen narrowed her eyes at him. The snow had already begun by then, and now it did not end. It covered the palace grounds, the once green gardens, the herald tree. It blanketed the hills and the fields. It covered houses. Whole villages simply disappeared. The lakes froze over and then the sea. Children's faces grew thin and gray. Old ladies kneeled over and froze in the streets. When the room was ready, the marvelous boy was led along the great corridors. In the palace, there were hundreds of rooms and hundreds of staircases and hundreds of great glass cabinets. Displayed there were her jewels and her other still trophies, snow lions and leopards, white elephants, snowy owls, a whole room of them frozen in time, their wings pinned open on the mounting boards. 
There were great mosaic floors depicting the wedding pageant of the king and queen, and wintry worlds and sea monsters eating boatloads of people. Whatever made you think of that? asked the king about the sea monsters. It was a story I once heard, said the queen, and I enjoyed it. She really was very cruel. The boy did not struggle as he was led to his room. He had struggled already. Three times since the wedding he had tried to run from the city, and three times he had been returned. Around the door there had been painted a mural of his marvelous journey. In the mural the boy stood with his magical sword raised, but at the door his sword was taken from him and handed to the king. His satchel, too, which contained the instructions and his compass. The boy looked to the king, but the king would not return his gaze. Inside his room there was nothing but a bed and chair and one window high up. The queen smiled and looked very pleased. She fingered the key on the chain at her throat. You have failed in everything you set out to do, she said when they were alone, just the marvelous boy and her. I do not know why the wizards chose you, such a poor, sorry thing. Why did they think you could defeat me? She did not pause for his answer. And this charm that is bestowed on you so that I cannot harm you, it is nothing but an irritation. When the charm has worn off, I will run you through with my sword. What are years to me? I shall build a clock to count the seconds and minutes and days and years, and when they're past, its chimes will sound, yes, and I will harm you. She said it very pleasantly, as though she were talking about marshmallows or afternoon tea. I will find the sword, the boy said, and the one who will wield it. It will be destroyed, said the queen, melted down, chopped into a thousand pieces. We will find a way to defeat you, said the boy, which made the queen very amused, so that she laughed quite merrily. Then she left him there, closed his door, and turned the key. Chapter One in which Ophelia Jane Worthington Wittard discovers a boy in a locked room and is consequently asked to save the world. Ophelia did not consider herself brave. She wasn't like Lucy Coutts, the head girl in her grade, who had once rescued a baby in a runaway stroller and was on the front page of all the papers. Lucy Coutts had heavy brown hair and pink cheeks, and she called Ophelia Scrap, which made everyone laugh, even Ophelia, to show she didn't mind. Ophelia didn't consider herself brave, but she was very curious. She was exactly the kind of girl who couldn't walk past a golden keyhole without looking inside. The keyhole was in a foreign city where it always snowed. It was on the third floor of the museum in the 303rd room. Ophelia wasn't at all sure how she got there, only that she let her feet take her wherever they wanted to go. Her father had taken a job at the museum. He had become, at the 11th hour, the curator of battle, the greatest exhibition of swords in the history of the world. The previous curator had left without warning. In three days, Ophelia's father was to prepare hundreds of swords to be exhibited on Christmas Eve. He also hoped that a week in a foreign city would be just the medicine for his daughters. They could explore and ice skate while he worked, and they would have a white Christmas away from their home, which had grown so quiet. He was very busy, though, far too busy to spend much time with them. He told Ophelia she must stay close to her sister Alice, but Alice was not interested in seeing any of the attractions. She wanted to go nowhere and do nothing. She wanted to sit all day with her headphones playing gloomy music and thinking gloomy thoughts. She'd been like that ever since their mother died, which was exactly three months, seven days, and nine hours ago. So all morning, Ophelia had walked alone. She had been upstairs and down, she had climbed in and out of elevators that rattled and creaked between the floors. There were grand galleries filled with priceless treasures and glittering halls filled with dazzling relics. There were precious paintings by the old masters and glorious statues and huge urns, and the ceilings danced with painted angels. Ophelia tried as hard as she could to be interested in all of these things. She leaned her head to one side and nodded approvingly. She looked up interesting facts in the rather useless guide. She tried to stifle all her yawns. But fortunately, these glimmering places also led to murky corridors, and these murky corridors also led to dimly lit rooms, and these rooms contained smaller, stranger collections, and it was these places that made Ophelia's heart beat faster. She found a lonely room filled with teaspoons, which led to a room containing only telephones, which led to a shadowy arcade of mirrors. She passed through an exhibition of stuffed and preserved elephants, 
She tiptoed through a quiet pavilion filled with the threadpair, daxidermied bodies of wolves. She squeezed through the crowd in the gallery of time and saw the famous wintertide clock. It ticked so loudly that people had to stick their fingers in their ears. She ran down a long, dim hallway filled with melancholy paintings of girls. It was very cold. Windows were left open to stinging sparks of sleet and snow. The wind whistled and moaned through the galleries and down the stairwells. It made the cobwebs on the chandeliers dance. Even with a map, it was a very confusing place. Signs pointed in the wrong directions, and no one bothered about fixing them. A sign for porcelains led to costumes and cultures of the Renaissance. A sign for costumes and cultures of the Renaissance led to Bronze Age artifacts. The sign for Bronze Age artifacts led to an imposing, red, locked door. There was no point in asking the guards. The guards sat in corners and knitted or dozed. Sometimes they snarled and yelled like banshees for no good reason, and other times they let children climb on the glass cabinets using the brass handles for footholds. Sometimes they came rushing at people who just happened to stand too long in one place, and other times they smiled huge, toothless smiles and offered old fruit from their large, black handbags. The museum in the city where it always snowed was the type of place where a person could very easily get lost. Miss Kaminsky, the museum curator, had said so herself. Miss Kaminsky was dazzlingly beautiful. Her blonde hair was tied in an elegant bun, and she was surrounded by a cloud of heavenly perfume. She had smiled at Ophelia and Alice before placing a perfectly manicured hand on their father's arm. It is advisable that they do not wander alone, Miss Kaminsky said. The museum is very big, and several girls have become lost and never found again. But Ophelia didn't feel afraid. It was much better on her own. It was a relief to be out of the workroom, where her father had begun working as soon as they arrived in the city. He was unpacking swords and polishing swords and cataloging swords endlessly. Her father knew everything there was to know about swords. His card read, Malcolm Wittard, leading international expert on swords. If ever you have the chance to visit this museum, the keyhole to room 303 is quite close to a much celebrated sea monster mosaic floor. It is marked on the maps by an octopus symbol. That first morning, Ophelia spent some time walking on the mosaic waves and the mosaic foam. She traveled the length of all eight glittering tentacles, observed the people falling back from the monster's mouth. She bent over and looked directly into its eye. It was the sort of thing her mother would have loved. Ophelia Jane Worthington Wittard wished more than anything that her mother was alive. Near the sea monster mosaic floor, she noticed a gallery with a red rope hung across its entrance. Ophelia slipped under the rope and went inside. It was a small exhibition of broken stone angels. There was no guard in the room, so she touched some wings, even though she knew she shouldn't have. It was very quiet and very still. All she could hear was her own footsteps and her own breathing. It had a peculiar, empty smell. No one had been this way for a very long time. In the corner of the room, there was a very normal-looking gray door. Above the door were the small civil numbers 302. Ophelia opened it. The room behind the ordinary gray door was also almost normal. The floor was a checkerboard. The tall windows with tatty velvet curtains pulled back gave a view of the city. The sky was also gray. The room would have also been ordinary if it wasn't for the little stage at its end and the faded mural of mountains and a blue sea and a boy with a sword. Above this scene, painted in golden letters, cracked and peeling, stretching in an arch, were the words, The Marvelous Boy. There was a small door. It was hidden among the peaked blue waves with their little white caps, and in the small door there was a golden keyhole. Ophelia crossed the checkerboard floor and climbed one step up onto the stage and walked across the floorboards. She knelt down to the keyhole and pressed her eye against it to see inside. She did it without thinking. It was the type of girl she was. She did not expect anything unusual. She did not expect to be looking straight into a large blue-green eye. Okay, readers, that's where we'll stop for today. If you liked what you heard and you want to hear the rest of the story, call the library or visit bowbakerfreelibrary.org to reserve Ophelia and the Marvelous Boy by Karen Foxley. The library also owns this title as an audiobook. If you like modern-day fairy tales, here are a few other books you might enjoy. Ella Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine, based on the story of Cinderella. The Goose Girl by Shannon Hale. 
The Girl Who Circumnavigated Fairyland in a Ship of Her Own Making by Catherine M. Valenti. All three of these books are also available at the library. Thank you for listening to First Chapter Fridays. Until next week, readers, Happy New Year. Thank you.